Hey y'all, thank you for tuning in again. Today, sorry, I just had to check to make sure it was recording. Uh, today, we've got Jim Butcher's Deadbeat, which is book 7 of the Dresden Files. We are on today, chapter 32. And Dresden has just how <clears throat> become a warden. Let's go ahead and find out what is going to happen with him as a warden and what they're going to do to take care of Kemlar. We have about 11 chapters left of this book. <clears throat> when I walked through the door to Murphy's house, it was raining, and I was still wearing the gray cloak. I limped into the kitchen where Thomas and Butters and Bob were sitting at the table with a bunch of candles, paper, pencils, and empty cans of Coors. Thomas's jaw dropped open. Holy crap, he said. Butters blinked at Thomas and then at me. Uh, what? Harry, Bob said, orange eyes light, glowing brightly. You stole a warden's cloak? I scowled at them and took the cloak off. It dripped all over the kitchen floor. I didn't steal it. Mouse came padding into the room, tail wagging and I rubbed briefly at his ears. Oh, Bob said, so you took it off a body? No, I said annoyed and settled onto a chair at the table. I got drafted. Holy crap, Thomas said again. I don't get it, Butters said. Harry's joined the wizard secret police, Bob burbled. He gets to convict on suspicion and take justice into his own hands. How cool is that? Thomas looked at me steadily, and then at the door behind me, then back to me. I'm alone, I said quietly. Relax, he nodded. What happened? A lot, I said. And there isn't time enough to cover it all right now. But the wardens are in town, and I'm not so worried about them crawling all over and finding out everyone's secrets. Why not? Thomas asked. Because at the moment, all five of them are at a hotel downtown, getting showers and changing bandages, while I try to come up with more information about the heirs of Kemlar. Thomas blinked slowly. All five? And they have wounded? I nodded, my lips pressed hard together. Wow, Thomas said quietly. How bad is it? They drafted me. I said. That's bad, all right, Bob said cheerfully. I looked at the scattered papers and books on the table. Tell me, you guys come up with something? Butters blinked a few times, and then started fumbling at the papers on the table, peering at them in the candlelight. Uh, well, um, there's good news, and there's bad news. Bad first, I said. I'm going to need a pick-me-up afterward. We've got nothing on those numbers. Butters said. I mean, they aren't a code. They're too short. They could be an address or an account number, but none of the banks we could get on the phone use the number of digits. He coughed apologetically. If I could have gotten on the net, I could have gotten you a lot more, but he gestured uselessly around the room. We couldn't get one call in 50 to go through. And at most of the places we called, no one answered. And in the past hour, the phones have gone out all together. I shook my head. Yeah, city's going insane, too. There were two fires between here and McAnally's. Some kind of riot going in Bucktown, I heard on the police radio. The governor has asked for help from the National Guard, Thomas said quietly. They're sending troops in to keep order on the streets. I blinked. How did you find that out? I called my sister, she said. I frowned. I thought Laura wasn't speaking with you. Thomas's voice went dry. Just because she cut me off from the family's money, kicked me out of any of our holdings, made it clear that I no longer have their protection, and she's holding the woman I love as a virtual prisoner, don't think she doesn't still like me personally. So, she did you a little favor, I said? Technically, Thomas said. She did you a little favor. Why did she do that? I asked. Well, 
I hinted about since her entire power base depended on a certain secret being kept, and since you're awfully irrational about protecting the good citizens of Chicago, that you might develop loose lips to sink her ship if she didn't help you in a moment of need. Um, I said, so you're telling me that I just engaged in blackmail against the ruler of the White Court by proxy? Yeah, Thomas said. You've got some great big brass balls on you to do something like that, Harry. Um, I guess I do. I shook my head. Why did I do that? Because we needed help, Thomas said. We were getting nowhere fast. Lara's got a ton of resources available to her, and a lot of manpower. She was able to come up with some of the other information we needed. Which is the good news, Butters said. She wasn't blacked out and cut off from the internet like we are, and she was able to get a bunch of information we couldn't. He passed me a piece of paper, not on the numbers, but on her people was able to find out the Native American artifacts and weapons here in Chicago. I looked up sharply at Butters. Yeah? He nodded at the paper and I read over it. Yep, he said. The Native American Center is using their facility to host this big display on tribal hunting and warfare before all of us pale faces showed up with guns and smallpox. The History Channel is using it as part of the History of Warfare special, and they were filming there all last week. Yeah, I said. That could have some old hunter spirits attached to it. I reached over the list. Damn it. I should have remembered this myself. The Field Museum has that big Cahokian artifacts exhibit that Professor Bartlesby was in charge of. Hell. It was a bunch of Indian artifacts that Corpse Taker helped assemble himself, probably with tonight in mind. Butters nodded, and the Mitchell Museum up on Eviston has got more Native American artifacts than either one put together. Crap, I said. That's it. How do you know that? Butters asked. It only stands to reason, Bob supplied. The whole point is to summon up as many old spirits as possible, and then consume them. The most spirits are going to be attracted to wherever there is the most old junk. I nodded. I remember this place now. That museum's on the college campus, right? Kendall College, Butters confirmed. College campus on Halloween night, Thomas said. Hell of a place for a gang of necromancers to slug it out. There's going to be a lot of collateral damage. No, there isn't, I said. And I was surprised how vicious my own voice sounded. Because we're going to stop this stupid summoning. And then we're going to hunt those murderous bastards down and kill them. And there was dead silence in the kitchen. Thomas and Butters both stared at me. Expressions apprehensive. Maybe it's the cloak, Bob suggested brightly. Harry, do you feel any more judgmental and self-righteous than you did this morning? I took a slow and deep breath. Sorry, I said, sorry. And that came out kind of harsh. Maybe a little, Butters said. His voice was all but a whisper. I rubbed at my face and glanced at the battery-powered clock on the wall of Murphy's kitchen. Okay, sundown is just over an hour. I have to be ready to call up the Earl King by then. Um, Thomas said, Harry, if it's the Earl King's presence that's going to attract all of these old spirits to their old tools and stuff, then won't it do the same thing no matter who calls him up? Yeah, I said, unless the one who calls him traps him in a circle to contain his power and leaves him there. Bob made a sputtering sound. Harry, that's a dangerous proposition. No, scratch that. It's an insane proposition. Even assuming you have the will to trap something like the Earl King in a circle, and even if you keep him there all night, he is not going to let that kind of insult go. He'll come back the next night and kill you, if you're lucky. I can worry about that after I've done it, I said. Wait, Butter said. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, 
will it really matter? These guys don't have the bad magic book, right? Without that book, all they can do is call up the spirits. They can't, you know, eat them, right? We can't assume that they don't have it, I said. Gravain might have found it. But the other two couldn't, right? Butter said. Even if they haven't, they'll still be there, I said. They can't afford to assume that their rivals haven't gotten the book. So, they're going to show up with everything they have to try to prevent one of the others from going through with the ritual. Why? Butters asked. Because they hate each other, I said. And if one of them goes all godly, he's going to enjoy crushing the others. It'll probably be the first thing he does. Oh, Butters said. That's why I need you to do something for me, Thomas. My brother nodded. Name it. I grabbed a blank piece of paper and pencil and started writing. This is a note. I want you take it, to take it down to the address I'm writing down and get it to the wardens. I'm not going anywhere close to the wardens, Thomas said. You don't have to, I said. They're at a hotel. You can leave it at the desk and ask the clerk to take it to them. Then clear out fast. Are you going to trust a note? Thomas asked, skeptical. I told them to expect a messenger, if I couldn't get there myself. They know about the Earl King, that I'm trying to sidetrack him. They need to know where the heirs of Kemlar are going to be, so that they can take them down. Five of them, Thomas said quietly. They'll be outnumbered by one. I grimaced. It would be worse than that. Ramirez had looked like he could handle himself, but the two rookies couldn't have stood up to any of the heirs or their companions from what I'd seen. Once I've secured the Earl King, I'll be along as quick as I can. Besides that, they're wardens, I said. They'll take down Kemlar's flunkies. Or die trying, Thomas said. He grimaced. How should I get down there? I went to another kitchen drawer and rummaged in it until I found Murphy's spare keys. I tossed them to Thomas. Here, her motorcycle is in the shed. Right, he said, but his expression was weary. Is she going to mind me stealing her bike? It's in a good cause, I told him. The streets are bad, and the wardens need to get moving as soonest. Go. Thomas nodded, pocketed the keys, and shrugged into his leather jacket. I'll get back here as soon as I'm done. Yeah, I said quietly. Thomas. To the wardens, you're nothing but a white cork vampire. If they see you, they'll be out for blood. I understand, he said. His voice was a little bitter. If I'm not back in time, Harry, good luck. He offered me his hand and we traded grips hard. My hand must have been cold with nerves because his felt warm. Then he let go of my hand, nodded to Bob and Butters, and headed out into the rain. A minute later, Murphy's Harley grumbled in the backyard and then purred off into the gloom. I sat there in silence for a minute, then got up and went to the stove. I got the teapot out, filled it up, and put it on the gas burner to boil. It took me a minute to find Murphy's collection of teas, and it was graciously complex. I mean, come on, how many different types of tea do you really need? Maybe I'm prejudiced, because I take my tea with so much sugar that the actual flavor is sort of an aftertaste. I found some in instant bags that smelled vaguely minty. Tea? I asked Butters. Sure, he said. I got out two cups. What's next? he asked. Hot tea, I said. Staying warm. Then I go out in the rain and call up the Earl King. You're staying inside while I do. Why? he asked. Because it's going to be dangerous. Well, yeah, he said, but why inside the house? I mean, this super goblin can rip the walls apart, right? Strong enough to do it, probably, I said, but it can't. The house is protected by its threshold. Butters looked at me blankly. Which means what? I leaned a hip on the counter and explained. A threshold is a kind of energy that surrounds a home. It's, 
I frowned, thinking how to explain it. It's sort of like a home has a positive charge to it. If outside magic wants to come in, it has to neutralize that charge first. Big, tough things from the never-never need a lot of power just to stay in our world. They don't usually have enough to take out a threshold and still have enough juice to be dangerous. It's like that vampire thing, he asked. They can't come in if you don't invite them? Pretty much, yeah. If you invite something in, your threshold won't affect it. But other magical beings and energy have trouble with it. It's a solid defense. It didn't help your place much, Butters observed. My place is a rental apartment, I said. And except for the past several months, it's just been me living there. Doesn't give it the same kind of energy as you find in a long established home. Oh, is that why what they mean by safe as houses then? I smiled a little. A house doesn't make a home. When the place has got history, family, emotions, worries, joys, worked into the wood, that's when it gets a solid threshold. This house has been in the Murphy clan for better than a hundred years, and lived in for every one of them. It's solid. You'll be safe here. But it's not going to get loose once you call it up, Butter said. Right? That's the plan. But even if it did, you aren't the one who is going to piss it off. There won't be any reason for it to come after you. Oh, good, he said. He blinked at me and said apologetically, Not that I want it to come after you, Harry. I don't blame you, I said. Butters nodded. Why zombies, he asked. Huh? Sorry, changing topics, new question. Why do all these necromancer types use zombies? Not all of them do, I pointed out. Corpse Taker had called up a bunch of semi-corporeal ghosts, specters. But human, Butters said. Zombies look human. Specters look human. Why not whistle up a pack of decayed rats? Or maybe semi-corporeal mosquitoes? Why use people? Oh, I said. It's got to do with the kind of metaphysical impre impression that any given creature leaves upon its death. Sort of like a footprint. Human beings leave larger footprints than most animals, which means that you can pour more energy into reanimating them. They make stronger goons, Butters clarified. Yes. How come Gervain had fresh corpses when he came to get me, but he attacked your house with old ones? I mean, I saw those things up close, he shivered. Some of them must have been dated back to the beginning of the 20th century. Same reasons they animate humans instead of animals, I said. Older corpses leave a deeper metaphysical imprint. They're harder to call up. But once you get them here, they're easier to control, stronger, and more difficult to damage. Old corpses get you stronger undead flunkies, he said. Right, I said. I could see the wheels turning in Butter's head as he processed the information. He looked like he was busy lining up dozen more questions spawned by the answers to the first few. And I had a feeling he would pursue them with relentless curiosity. Okay, but what if... Butters, I said as gently as I could, not now. All I want to do is have a quiet cup of tea. An inspiration hit me. Ask Bob, I told him. Bob knows a hell of a lot more than I do, anyway. Oh, Butters said. He looked from me to the skull. Um, yeah, I guess Thomas was talking to it. Heh, <laughs> he, Bob said indignantly. I am very much a he. I am not some kind of freaking animatronic tinker toy. Right, Butters said. Um, sorry, Bob. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? It's a waste of my vast intellect and talent, Bob sneered. Do it, Bob, I told him. Oh, man. The orange lights in the skull eye sockets rolled. Fine. I haven't got anything better to do than to teach kindergarten. Great, Butters bubbled and sat down at the table. He grabbed some more paper and a pencil. Well, how about one cup of tea and one for Butters? 
I put the cup down near him, but he took little notice of it. He was deeply involved in a conversation with Bob. I slipped out into the living room and put away my aching leg up on a table, and then settled back onto the couch with my tea. I sat in the gloom, sipping hot, sweet, mint, something or other, and tried to order my thoughts. I was tired enough to, that it didn't take too long. I was about to call up a peer of Queen Mab and try to trap it for an entire night. A garden spider had about as much chance to trap a Bengal tiger, except that the Bengal tiger probably wouldn't bother to squash the spider for daring to make the attempt. The Earl King would. That made the whole notion more stupid than most of my plans. But I didn't have much choice in the matter. The presence of the Earl King in the area would drastically increase the number and the potency of the undead that the Kemlerites were planning to summon tonight. If I could block the Earl King's presence from Chicago, it would take a big chunk out of the powers that the necromancers would summon. Gravain and company were formidable enough without calling up an army of super zombies and uber ghosts. If I could stop that from happening, it might give Lucio and her wardens a real chance to defeat them. If I wasn't fast enough to call the Earl King before one of the Kemlerites, or if he escaped my hold and ran loose through Chicago, people would die. The Earl King would summon the Wild Hunt into a lightless Chicago Halloween night, and anyone they caught in the open would be torn to shreds. Lightning flickered outside, somehow too dark and dull to be natural. A beat later, thunder ripped through the evening air, shaking the little house. The wind started to pick up, and the steady beat of rain on the windows surged and retreated with its restless gusting. I didn't feel like a wizard. I didn't feel like a deadly and powerful warden. I didn't feel like a supernatural champion of Chicago, or of fearless foe of evil. A daring summoner able to cast his defiance into the teeth of a supernatural titan, or an enlightened sage of the mystic arts. I felt like a scared, battered, aching, one-handed man with few pleasant prospects for the future, and a ridiculous pair of pants with one leg slashed off. Mouse padded over to me through the dimness. He cuffed me softly, then laid his head down on my leg. My eyes were closed but I could hear his tail thumping softly against the couch. I rested my bad hand on Mouse's head and petted him awkwardly. Mouse didn't mind. He just leaned against me, loaning me the warmth of his fur and the silent faithfulness of his presence. It made me feel better. Mouse might not have been the smartest creature on earth, but he was steady, kind, loyal, and was possessed with the uncanny wisdom of beasts for knowing whom to trust. I might not have been a superhero, but Mouse thought it was that I was pretty darn cool. That meant something. It would have to be enough. I set my teacup down, took my foot off Murphy's coffee table, and rose. I picked up my staff without looking at it. Deep breath. And I clenched my jaw. Then I marched into the kitchen in a lopsided stock. Butters, I said, stay here with Bob and Mouse. Watch my back. If you see anyone trying to sneak up on me, give a yell. Right, he said. Will do. I nodded to him and went out into the rain to test my will against the legendary Lord of the Wild Hunt. Thank you for listening to Chapter 32 of Book 7 of the Dresden Files. Please do stay tuned for the other chapters of this book. And I do want to thank you guys very much for taking the time out of your day to read along with me. Thank you very much also for liking or disliking my channel, subscribing, sharing it with others, and leaving comments down below. You all have a wonderful and blessed day.